All right, so thank you very much. And it's an honor to be giving this presentation with Andrew Eckford, a good friend of mine and a great colleague. So I look forward to seeing his half of the presentation. So I've already, uh, he's already stolen my introduction. I wanted to find out how many of you, he asked how many are from academia, how many of you are from industry? Okay, so majority are from industry. And then how many were from academia again? A little bit less. How many can you consider yourself both? <laughs> Everybody considers himself an academic, I guess. Okay, very good. So the correct answer is you all work for industry. Because, well, that's my position anyway, is that unless goods and services and products, and idea, unless ideas gets translated into services and products to benefit humanity, they're somewhat pointless to do to begin with. So we all need to get our stuff into industry. And by the way, my keynote's going to be a little bit more high-level philosophical. Um, I think Andrew will get down into the nuts and bolts of things a little bit better. So my thinking for this keynote, I wasn't sure what to talk about exactly, but I'm really interested in innovation. Where does creativity come from? Where does innovation come from? And because the academics write all the journals, they tend to say, well, everything occurs in academia and then filters down to, you know, the the less intelligent people who work in industry. I think that's exactly backwards. I think it's exactly backwards. And it's important that we, we understand why that's backwards. And by the way, I just put the standards defini standard definitions of creativity up on, I mean innovation up on the screen. Because again, I want to understand how ecosystems encourage innovation and how we can promote that as well as possible. So if we look at sort of the three-dimensional space of innovation, or, or uh, this space that I'm looking at here. The two rows are, you see industry on the top, academia on the bottom. Then you see columns going down. You see standards. You see innovation, which I think feeds everything else. You see publications, and you see patents. Green is where there's a lot of activity. Yellow means a little bit of activity. The red means no activity. So we see that industry is very heavy on standards, patents. Academia is, again, this is my impression, I may be wrong, but very heavily focused on the publication side. Okay, and the problem is that in all these, in this space, there's very little intersecting green columns here. There's no green column that unites these two areas. There's this thin film of, of separation between the two. And this is bad, and then this is what we have to eliminate. And it means that academia, unfortunately, has little impact, little real impact on industry. And, and both suffer because of it. So that's what I want to talk about, again, at a more philosophical level. And again, my intention is to perhaps poke academia a little bit. And you can beat me up later, but this is, this is just uh, one viewpoint. And it shows you how industry perhaps thinks. That uh, first, industry is the one out in the field that sees the problems. They're the first to see the problems. They're the first to solve the problems. And so that's where innovation comes from. It flows to academia. Again, this is just my viewpoint. Academia produces papers. And the final product is filling a much needed void. You know, How much of those, those papers and publications come back to help industry? That's the real question. So what is the ecosystem for academia? And, and what might be some of the problems? Well, you have a lot of things get solved first through patents. So if I take the worst case here, you know, a professor comes up with an idea that's probably been patented or looked at by industry a decade earlier. Then there's a herd mentality in academia because you know this guy is probably very uh, has a big name or is, uh, gave an idea that looked interesting. All the other academic folks kind of crowd around it and try to copy it and add their twist to it. And then it goes to you know they decide to write a paper and it goes to peer review. And who does the peer review? Ninety-nine percent of the time it's academia. So it's the blind leading the blind. And then the cycle completes because this person gets his paper, these people get their paper accepted, they present it, and the cycle continues and continues, and you end up with a big pile of papers 
in the academic sitting in his office saying, aren't you impressed with all my papers? So this is the thing we want to kind of, that's okay, there's nothing wrong with that, but we want to get this, these results into industry. That's the goal. And, and then the, the, the sad side effect is that the academic is saying, well, I don't have any funding, nobody cares about my work, I look at all these citations, look at my huge impact factor, what have I really accomplished? So the ideas have to get into industry to become self-sustaining. So I hope, hope I made that clear. <clears throat> so there have been studies on how much of academic uh, results really do impact industry. And this is from the National Academy of Engineering uh, from a while back. And it's saying that there's no good way to track it. And academia doesn't really try to track it for some reason and that there needs to be ways of adjusting the reward structure, perhaps in academia, to sort of motivate the focus on getting stuff into industry. <clears throat> okay? So that was the sort of the academic, ecos the academic ecosystem, again, from perhaps an industry point of view. This is the ecosystem from the industry point of view. This is the, in, the industry e, uh, ecosystem, innovation ecosystem. <clears throat> These are the technical readiness levels, which go from one being a conceptual idea, all the way up to nine being a final product. So how many ideas do you think, starting out at the uh, conceptual level, actually make it across the valley of death, all the way up into uh, a final product? Probably very few. Very few actually make it. Or if they do make it, they make it, uh, you know, they don't make it unscathed, I'll put it that way. There's a tremendous amount of work that it takes to get an idea from here all the way up to a final product. Now what I have here is, is the public funding coming in. So, you know, that's all the government funding, the money that comes from the taxpayers. That's the big sort of feeding trough that academia feeds upon. And in order to have a self-sustaining ecosystem, some of that results, some of those results from public funding have to get back into industry so that industry can produce goods and products that help society and that also generate more tax money. And that tax money can come back and then help feed new ideas. If, they don't, if these ideas don't make it across, you know, it's, it's really a big waste of money um, to be putting in there. So, we need to support this cycle and make ideas uh, more self-sustained. So this is a workshop on standards. How do standards play into that? Well, there's a traditional view of standards that it's a bunch of really smart people that get together in a room, they put their best ideas into a standard, and then it's an easy thing for industry to use to sort of communicate all the great ideas and, and make it easy to implement into products. I'm wondering if we should rethink that. Can we use standards to help cross this bridge over the valley of death of ideas? Can we use standards earlier in the conceptual process to help the innovation process become more, uh, to encourage innovation more and help the ideas uh, get across better? So that's kind of a rethinking of, of how standards might be applied. So if you're going to apply standards earlier, and have a good mix between academia and industry and developing standards, the standards provide an agreement on the definition of the problem. Because so often, again, academia is sort of disconnected from the real problem. They need to understand how industry sees the problem and apply it, uh, and apply their solutions that way to make the, the solutions more relevant. Standards can provide a common intellectual framework. And again, we're not, we have to be careful, I'll have another slide on this later, but some of the dangers with, that I'm sure you all know with standards, but it can help orient solutions to the problem. And obviously, plug and play of ideas. But notice I say plug and play of ideas, not products, ideas. How can we create standards that help um, concepts and ideas uh, flourish? And so I'm leading the uh, COMSOC uh, Standards and Publications Development Board, which is trying to think of uh, these kinds of things 
for uh, for standards.